So to continue where we stop, this is the representation of the radial symmetric weight. And uh, probably I would have to, to choose some number between 15 and 16 to have a more exact match, but I don't want to do this here. So uh, what I want to show you is uh, just as a kind of, uh, you know, to, to understand what's happening without understanding exactly what, what's going on, I would like to show you how to convolve a, a Dirac comp with a function. And here it's just an indicator function of a circle. So it's, you think of a podest, a round podest or chair where you can sit and there are lattice points, they are marked. And what you're doing here when you do the convolution, each lattice point is representing a shift. So actually that's in the lecture room here, we are having marks and the chairs are supposed to be above the marks and that's what i want to demonstrate here so i'm taking a coarse lattice now uh, i can also uh, check uh, that uh, the sum of the lattice points i'm counting the lattice points and i'm running the routine now i mean the second uh, this segment So we have 400 positions. And um, in order to explain why I'm doing what I'm doing next, I'm doing, first of all, a convolution. Now, the general fact is if you convolve two functions, uh, and just think of you're multiplying two real valued polynomials, what are you getting? Definitely you will get real valued polynomials even if you're starting with integer values polynomials so coefficients are integers then you could even round off because you know it should be real and if you would get coefficients of the form 4.99997 it would be of course uh, five so but here i'm checking that i know it must be real and um, it's now a two-dimensional convolution so you can think of a multiplication of polynomials of two variables and I have this circle and filter, I have these lattice points, I put them to the Fourier domain, and then I take the inverse Fourier transform. So I'm taking these two objects, I'm convolving them by multiplying on the Fourier transform side, and then I'm getting numbers. I get a real valued function, and now I'm looking at these numbers. These numbers are a lot of very small values and uh, some large values. Now, uh, the large values are, of course, the interesting one, and these are noisy zeros. So you can take any threshold, which probably is, I don't know, maybe 1000 epsilon or so. I choose 0.1. You see, it's, there's nothing happening between, uh, well, close to 1 and, and, and 1. So that's the indication. So instead of, because, I mean, I was just doing the command. Well, now I look at this. I made this pi command, but this pi command just says, is there a non-zero entry? And if even if it's very, very small, tiny value, it would say there is something. Uh, there was not the original value zero. So that's why I have to do this. I have to put this here. Then I get a zero one function. Uh, sometimes you have to, uh, to convert it to logical. So um, if you compute and compare, uh, sorry, it might be viewed as a logical vector, which has a positive or true be viewed as a one which only looks as a one and then you would have to do a double so maybe i tell you the command to be sure you could say maybe uh, so that you see what i'm doing uh, i'm not sure if it if that works but i think it might be necessary occasionally to convert it from a logical zero one matrix to a, a numerical one but still the plot would be this and now uh, I'm only showing you this here in a localized version. So zoom four means I'm not showing everything. I better show uh, the details, but maybe I'm doing, uh, I endow the plot with some axis. And so you see, this was the original one and the, the lattice point down 24 is having the center at 24. So in the color, row number 25, 24 down from one. And the next one would have the center at coordinate 25, 25 and so on. And that would be uh, 49, uh, 
horizontal and 25 down and so on. So you have just copied this here. And if you would have another starting point, you would see images copied here. Now, uh, the next thing is that I, I'm showing you that the cytic mud is a routine that is just switching uh, main diagonals to, hub, to I mean, uh, yeah, side diagonals in the cyclic way to row vectors. But in fact, it's an automorphism of the group. So if you have a lattice uh, before, then it's afterwards also a lattice. And so here I'm doing a command that it's uh, showing you the, sure. Yeah, I have this red figure and I apply this transformation to these things. And I also do it to, to these things here. Now, what maybe it's not so good, and maybe I'm repeating this, I'm not sure if it's working now, uh, but maybe to make it a little bit smaller, because uh, in this way, it seems that uh, here the lattice is again the old lattice, so it's <laughs> invariant lattice. And uh, so I'm changing it now and hope that it's having a more interesting effect. Yeah, you see the original, that was by, mis not by mistake, but uh, kind of by luck, if you want. If I choose 24, 24, it has the apparent property that the cytic mat maps the lattice into itself. So that's another interesting thing. You have an automorphism leaving a sub discrete, discrete subgroup invariant. So the points went into the same points but they had different labels. So the, this point was not a fixed point, but the point uh, image of another point. Here you see it's, the deformation is the same, of course, of these areas, but also the center points are moving a little bit around or so. But what you, the point is of this, sometimes you may have a different lattice and you see that everything which is living in the red thing. So if you have an image with pure frequency spectra coming from this, and you would sample it at something which is in the orthogonal lattice for this lattice, then you would be able to find out that, uh, that, this, that they are still disjoint. And so how would you recover, let's say, the central object, the spectrum of a two-dimensional image uh, from the periodized version? Well, you have to design a function which is constant one on this, or maybe you just say, I have to cut with this indicator function of this. And that will be uh, something a bit different from an ordinary sync function, or if that would be, the original was a rectangle filter, you would have a sync function in X and Y direction, and this is a deformed one, but experimentally, this is quite nice. Okay, so I'm trying to continue. Now, again, uh, the Fourier transform is, is a unitary mapping and so is the symplectic Fourier transform. And just to recall, whereas you say I'm, I'm doing this color product, uh, and now I'm writing this color product in this way, uh, I could also take the trace of the product of first matrix with transpose conjugate of the second. That gives the same thing. And also, if you are saying now I'm taking the color product, so the symplectic Fourier transform is unitary because applying it twice gives you the same. Okay, now, uh, if we apply the, the, the symplectic Fourier transform to the standard lattice, we will get the adjoint lattice. So I hope uh, there is, the noise will not disturb too much. And you see that we have to compensate for the redundancy factor, but that's actually how I comp uh, compute the joint lattice. So the, what is the, the role of the joint lattice? It's the set of all time frequency shifts which commute with the original ones. So if now my lattice is a collection of time frequency shift operators, and if this is a group represented in this way, I need very often the ones which commute completely. I may also ask if a group is um, is commutative and in this case i would ask whether the group uh, is the lattice is contained in this adjoint lattice because uh, 
if the group is part of the a joint lattice means it's part of the group of elements which is commuting. So if every element is commuting by all the elements in the group, it's a commutative group. So that would be a test for commutativity. And it turns out that it's typically if the group has a redundancy or if the number of elements is a fraction, an integer fraction, let's say, uh, the joint group of a lattice with redundancy two or three or five or so in our case would be a commutative lattice and that makes things quite, quite easier I would say. Now another thing which I want to explain uh, before finishing today is um, this the same thing with indices. So sometimes we are especially when we move on to irregular Gabor we have to say well we are dealing with samples of the short term free transform at certain positions. And it's clear that we can describe the samples either by row or column coordinates or by running index going through the first column, first, second column, and so on. So we are labeling each position by an index which is in the range from one to n squared. So the find command is doing this exactly. So you could ask how long is this index sequence? Uh, that's clearly uh, uh, length 720, maybe I'm checking it for you. And also what are the first ones, uh, the first three ones or so, and we can already predict. This will be number one and we get down by 16, so it will be 17. Two times 16 is 32, so 33 will be the result. And uh, of course, this is what you get here. The same can be done to label these things and you find out uh, the lengths of this uh, is the same as, of course, the sum of the lambdas and you turn it into a row vector, then it's cheaper or you take the sum of the sum and um, that's 320 is the inverse of the redundancy times n, so it's two thirds of n and so on. And just uh, to say that now um, the uh, color product and kind of I want to use now this fact we have this um, general rule so if somebody takes a color product of two Fourier transforms or two dimensional Fourier transform or even better here symplectic here symplectic Fourier transform of two signals uh, you're getting by, uh, with suitable normal and here without normalization, you get the same as this color product here. Now, what happens if this is a lattice, an indicator function of a lattice? We've seen that this is the indicator function of the joint lattice. And so uh, there are two notions in the literature. One is uh, the Poisson summation formula, and we are having a kind of an intuitive proof now. Here, everything is discrete and finite. So a um, unitary mapping is uh, preserving scalar products. And if we are in the good luck situation that an indicator function of a subgroup is just a zero one function, giving you on the Fourier transform or symplectic Fourier transform side another indicator function, then you just have to put now V V as an indicator function. And that's what I wanted to demonstrate here is whether you're doing a scalar product with an indicator function, let me see where it is. Yeah, uh, yeah, the, the, I didn't uh, show it in this way. You could say, uh, uh, yeah, uh, here I could say I'm taking the lum. Uh, with uh, as an indicator function and then multiply it with u taken as a row vector as a column vector sorry yeah so you see from the unitary property i would get that some function which appears as an indicator function has a scalar product but moving it to the free transform side it gives you another thing which is uh, here you have now you have the values of the function, the two-dimensional function, whatever it is, summed over a lattice, 
is the same as the Fourier symplectic Fourier transform over the joint lattice. So this is just a random function at the arbitrary lattice. You can try other lattices and you see this color product is valid. But this is just a consequence of the unitarity property plus the fact that indicator functions of subgroups go to indicator functions of subgroups. And if you take the ordinary two-dimensional Fourier transform, then you get the orthogonal group. And if you take the symplectic Fourier transform, you're getting the adjoint group. So the commutator in the time frequency sense. Uh, okay, I'm trying to come to an end, but let's see. Yeah, here uh, I'm taking again, yeah, more or less directly the scalar product with this adjoint group, or I'm saying, uh, yeah, and then you see that uh, this is again giving you a normalization factor. And now the same thing for um, the the symplectic free transform. So essentially, it shows you this is nothing else but, okay, so what is lambs? Uh, yeah, probably a joint lattice of lambs. Yeah, that should work. But I can also do a comparison whether this lambs uh, is. Well, you recall, I mean, recall here is explained what I'm doing. I'm re replacing, uh, maybe I should also show you this slanted lattice. And maybe I make a section break here. So I'm making the oblique lattice. So that's the cheap way to produce a, a, a non separable lattice, not just A and B. So you see it's here, it has 720 elements, of course same redundancy as the original one same number and so on now uh, what i'm doing here is i am trying to show you that whether you take the joint of the slanted or the slanted version of the joint that's the same so it's side stigma of lama the joint lattice uh, and the other one was i take the, the joint lattice of the slanted one so it's going in a coherent way. If you deform by an automorphism the lattice, then the orthogonal lattice will go in the opposite direction. Maybe I should also show this. Uh, you, you would use the side too much routine for the orthogonal lattices, but for the symplectic lattices, you apply the same automorphism, and that's very nice. And so you can say, the indices that we have, uh, yeah, I think that this was the idea to prepare Poisson's formula by going through the indices, so that, that you would say, well, the sum of the lattice on uh, of the of the function on on the lattice points, but that's of course, as we have seen in this earlier example, just the same as the scalar product of some function with the indicator function. So that's a viewpoint. How do you sum? Uh, certain values over a function of a two-dimensional function well either you pick up the values at the pixel positions and add these numbers or you take formally a scalar product between the indicator function which is one at the pixels and that's exactly the same so this is a sum of one times the pixel values summed over all the pixels where you have a one or you're summing taking out the values and summing over this so for a mathematician, there's no big difference. Now, uh, the for the end, I see I'm going over time from, oh, a little bit. I'm trying to finish this here. I'm taking the test matrix and, uh, and I want to describe a little bit that this side stigma is not only an, I mean, it's an automorphism, but essentially it's a permutation so well the first thing is uh, if i apply the test matrix to this uh, i get a new matrix but i can also say now i'm converting this matrix the new matrix so i'm after applying the matrix where each position has one two three four at the beginning i get this one and if i say now i convert it i can exactly tell you uh, that there is now an index sequence. And uh, the nice thing is that if you take now a random matrix, 
so I didn't even show it here, a four by four matrix, then I can apply to this matrix uh, the, the, the side stigma routine. So you can say, okay, probably this was the main diagonal, uh, first row was the main diagonal of the original one and so on, and the side two mat goes back. But what I can also do, I can say, no, I have this sequence, maybe, um, yeah, well, the sequence is clear what it is. It's 1, 5, 9, 13, 6, 10, 14 or so. So you can say, no, what I'm doing is I'm taking an empty 4 by 4 matrix. So kind of, I think it will be this, like, uh, this side tag version. And I insert uh, the values of the original matrix at the positions, but in the order 1, 5, 7, or so in the, exactly the order that we have here. And of course, this is giving the same two matrices. And uh, I can do the same with the index for the inverse test. So this side two mat, and I can try to see that on the test matrix, the effect is the same. And I can also, of course, say, well, what is the, I mean, that, that you see that these are really permutations and uh, one is uh, providing the inverse of the other one. If you insert the index sequence into the in other index sequence and in one or the other order, I show you only the first ones. Uh, I was surprised that the second command was giving a column vector, but for easier display, I was replacing it by a row vector. So that's why you have this. Here. And uh, just to finish, uh, yeah, the symplectic version of the symplectic version of any matrix is the original one. So this has to be rerun. And uh, since this is true for any matrix, and this is giving us the same uh, property, you can say the joint lattice for the adjoint lattice. So this was the slanted lattice adjoint is the same as the original slanted lattice. And of course, this is true for any lattice. So I think uh, that's a good point uh, to finish here. I will try to produce a PDF uh, from this and, uh, and send it, uh, put it up to the course notes. So 